Welcome to True Health Tuesdays. Today we're going to talk about sunshine and the flu. And we seem to be coming out of the flu season, but it's worthwhile talking about because as we are getting longer and longer days, it's going to be more important for us to get outside and take advantage of that sun. And even more importantly, as we get into fall and finally into winter again. So it's the cycle that keeps going. And for those who may have forgotten, we didn't have that great of a flu season this year. What I mean by that was that there was quite a bit of flu, and especially in California, where I am growing up and living here. But for those of you around the country and even around the world, there was some interesting aspects that we're going to talk about here with sunshine and the flu and some studies that have come out looking at this issue. And of course, when we talk about the flu, I like to talk about the Swiss cheese model. No, not specifically eating Swiss cheese, but talking about basically this idea that it takes multiple layers to prevent something from happening. So when we're in the operating room and we try to prevent infections from happening, we make sure that the physicians and the nurses are scrubbed in. They're wearing sterile gowns. They're using sterilized equipment, that they're wearing masks, that we have the air in the room under positive pressure, and a, a number of things. We want to keep the temperature and the humidity. So all of these are employed to reduce the incidence of infections. And so when we talk about one or two different things here in terms of the influenza, remember that we don't mean to say that the other things that have been shown to decrease the, the influenza virus are not useful. So we mean by that is flu shots, hand hygiene, uh, quarantining, isolation, ventilation. These are all things that are important in terms of preventing the flu or indeed other illnesses that uh, are still making the ways around, including COVID-19, flu, metanumavir, influenza virus, the common cold, etc., etc. So this was a paper that was published back in 2021, so not too long ago. So what they did here was they looked at sunlight and protection against influenza. And the key here is that they were looking at the amount of sunshine at a specific area over a number of years and see whether or not it correlated with influenza risk. They say here that given that sunlight levels in a geographic area for a particular week vary randomly over the years, this provides us with a robust estimate. So they looked at a number of years all the way from 2018. So this is all before the pandemic. And they mapped it out based on the calendar week of the year. So here is New Year's. And as you can see here, most of the flu or influenza-like illnesses are in that first part of the year. Well, there was actually a year where the flu came much earlier, and that was in 2009. And that year we had an antigenic shift instead of an antigenic drift. And that was because this was a completely different arrangement of the proteins on the surface of the influenza virus. In fact, it was very similar to the, 19, the 2009. It was an H11 type of influenza. As you can see, the 2009 flu season was substantially more severe than any other season in our sample. In addition, there was substantially less sunlight that year than in the average year and much more variability in those deviations. These deviations facilitate estimation. Hence, 2009 is a clear and substantial negative relationship emerges between relative differences in sunlight and differences in the flu level. So let's take a look and see what they found when they correlated this. And you can see here that these red dots are data points from 2009. But for the most part, what you see here is that when you look at sunlight level, in terms of the mean difference, and here's zero, which is sort of starting off at baseline, that as the amount of log difference of sunlight goes down, the difference in influenza goes up. And conversely, as the amount of sunlight goes up, the amount of influenza goes down. And of course, this is looking at a large sample, in a national sample, as you can see. These other years are mixed in here. Again, these red, this red area here is a lot of variability that they saw in 2009. 
And if we look at the state of New York, which is gonna be obviously a smaller sample size and it's gonna be less variable. Here we're looking at county month deviations for the flu and sunlight in September and October. And we can see again that when we look here at zero, that as the mean sunlight level goes up, we start to see a general increase in the sunlight level. We see a decrease in the flu index. And when we go below zero, it starts to go up and we actually have increased levels in the flu. So this caused them to speculate, therefore, Apart from its methodological contributions, this study reinforces the long-held assertion that vitamin D protects against acute upper respiratory infections. We can secure vitamin D through supplements or through a walk outdoors, particularly on a day when the sun shines brightly, when most walk, herd protection provides benefit to all. So I would say that it's an interesting conclusion, but that the the notion that sunlight only provides vitamin D as the only benefit, I think, is actually quite short-sighted. Here is a study that was also published in 2009, actually, ironically, the same year that we had that uh, epidemic there of influenza. And they're looking back on a pandemic year of 1918-1919. And so they're looking at, again, vitamin D, the possible roles of solar ultraviolet B radiation and vitamin D in reducing case fatality rates in the pandemic during the United States. Okay, so let's take a look and see what they did. They looked at specifically different spots in the United States, and they looked at the number of influenza cases, the number of pneumonia cases, the number of influenza case fatality rates, and the number of pneumonia complications. And what they did was they looked at the amount of ultraviolet B dose that someone would get in July. So these numbers ostensibly would be high if you are closer to the equator. And then latitude would be low if you are closer to the equator. Remember now that on the globe, here's the equator, and here would have a low latitude. Here would be a 90 latitude. So we would expect that these two things here would be inversely proportional to each other. And in fact, that is exactly what we're seeing. So latitude here is the highest, and we have the lowest amount of ultraviolet B radiation. Here in San Antonio, Texas, we have the lowest latitude and some of the highest levels of UVB dosing. So what did they find when they looked at the case fatality rates? For instance, they found that the R, which is the correlation constant, or R squared here, we notice here that there is a negative correlation between case fatality rate and the amount of ultraviolet B radiation, which means more ultraviolet B radiation, according to this, or more sunlight, is going to drop your case fatality rate. Also notice here that there was a correlation, a positive correlation, between case fatality rate and latitude. And notice that both of these were statistically significant. Now, what about pneumonia as a complication of influenza? Exactly the same thing. Ultraviolet B radiation negatively correlated, and that was statistically significant. And it was positively correlated with latitude, and that also was statistically significant. But is it really ultraviolet B radiation and vitamin D? Well, this was a study that was published out of the University of Edinburgh that looked at ultraviolet A radiation, which is different than B radiation, obviously, and COVID-19 deaths in the United States with replication studies in England and in Italy. What they did was they eliminated all of the areas of the United States in the wintertime that got enough vitamin D and only looked at those areas that could not get enough vitamin D. And what they found was as the amount of ultraviolet A radiation, or just basically sunlight, as it increased in dose, there was a reduction in the COVID-19 deaths per million. Same thing happened here in England. As the amount of radiation from the sun went up, there was a reduction in the case fatality rate. This would have been independent of vitamin D, 
because this was areas that you could not have gotten enough vitamin D at this time of the year. And by the way, this was corrected for population density, case proportion, transportation, age, ethnicity, and comorbidities. Again, same thing in Italy. Reduction in COVID-19 deaths per million when the amount of radiation went up. So it caused the authors of this study to say, in conclusion, the study is observational and therefore any causal interpretation needs to be taken with caution. However, if the relationship identified proves to be causal, it suggests that optimizing sun exposure may be a possible public health intervention. Given that the effect appears independent of a vitamin D pathway, it suggests new possible COVID-19 therapies. And we've talked about this before, is getting out in the sun, even if you're covered, the beneficial effects of the sun is what we call infrared. And that portion is able to penetrate through linen, it's able to penetrate through cloth, it's able to do what it needs to do, and I believe cause an improvement in health. I'm also recommending this for our long COVID patients because I believe that in long COVID, the mitochondria have been damaged by the virus. And in order for the metabolism to improve, in order for energy levels to improve, we need to recycle those mitochondria and protect them with melatonin. And one of the ways of doing that is good sun exposure. But there are a couple of reasons why people are not getting sun exposure enough. Number one is we spend about 93% of our awaking hours or life inside. And that's got to change. We need to make an effort to get outside, even if it's in the shade. Getting outside allows us the ability to get good infrared radiation. Notice here that these, these kids here on the orthopedic wards are still underneath the canopy. So they're not getting direct sun, but they're getting a lot of near-infrared, which basically is being reflected off of the nice greenery. So it's very important. Second reason is the lights that we have inside our homes are LED, and they do not give off radiation in the infrared spectrum. So that's another reason to get outside. And then finally, number three, the windows on our modern homes block out near-infrared radiation. So putting all of these together, you can see why very clearly the amount of near-infrared radiation has gone down a considerable amount. And what we need to do is to get outside to get our fill of near-infrared radiation. So that when we do it, we'll be pushing more towards this side of the graph rather than this side of the graph. And that would be one more slice in our Swiss cheese model to help us be protected against viral antigens. Until next time, thanks for joining us at True Health Tuesdays.